Hello, Courier Nation. Welcome to the Deliver on Your Business podcast, where you are the boss. Each week, we talk about how to make the most of your business as an independent contractor, as a courier delivering for gig economy apps like Grubhub, DoorDash, Postmates, Uber Eats, and so many others. Well, hey, Courier Nation. Welcome back for another week of the podcast here, the Deliver on Your Business. And this week, I'm really excited to have Elijah Blau on with us. You may know him if you have spent much time looking around on YouTube. You may know him uh, from his uh, YouTube channel, which is the app Lifestyle. Uh, once upon a time, it was the Uber Eats Lifestyle. And uh, I, I ran across him, I think, way early on, my very first uh, deliveries were with Uber Eats. And when I first started doing deliveries, I, I came across some of the, your training series back then and just a lot of good practical information that he has. So I'll put a link in the show notes for his channel and everything like that. But uh, Elijah is coming out with a book as well. He would be launching the book uh, very shortly called The Anatomy of Financial Success. And so I wanted to talk a little bit about that because I think finances is, is something that we really have to keep an eye on. You know, you know, the focus of what I'm trying to do here is to get you all to focus on the business aspect of what you're doing. The fact that you are running a business and uh, finance is a big part of that. So uh, there's there's some some great stuff that he's had. I've had a chance to look through a draft of his uh his book, a lot of great information, just just good stuff about money. So I'm looking forward to kind of talking with him a little bit about that. So Elijah, I want to welcome you and thank you for coming on to the podcast. And uh, folks, if you can hear the dogs barking in the background, I do apologize. Hopefully the microphone kind of kept that out from being too loud here. But uh, Elijah, you started out, I mean, you you really do, you're kind of the, I would call you the Uber Eats expert. And uh um, I want to start off maybe a little bit about how did you get into doing delivery with Uber Eats and, and what do you like about working with them? I appreciate you having me on, Ron. And uh, Uber Eats, ironically, I started as a rideshare driver for just a regular Uber. So I initially got started when I was uh, in, uh, involved in a network marketing company and I wanted to uh, subsidize my sales income. And a friend of mine referred to just a rideshare version of Uber. I said, yeah, I'll go ahead and uh, give it a try. So I did it. It turns out that I actually enjoyed it. So I did that for a good while. And uh, Uber Eats kept more or less harassing me from the Uber app saying, hey, do you want to do deliveries? Hey, do you want to do deliveries? Do you want to do deliveries? And at first I was thinking, um, no, mainly because before then they didn't have tipping on the platform. I was like, yeah, you, you got to be kidding me. And when tipping came, I was like, okay, you know what? Let me take another look at this food delivery thing because it couldn't hurt. And it turns out that when I started doing deliveries, at least in my particular market, you can actually make as much, sometimes more, just doing Uber Eats versus Uber X. I was very blown away, at, blown away by that. So I would get in the car, turn my Uber Eats on, and sometimes I would just do deliveries only. And I literally started comparing the two. And I was working either less hours with Uber Eats or I was making more money if I was working the same amount of hours. So I had I came to a choice where I was thinking, okay, I've got to pick between the two because having people and food presents its own challenges. I mean, your food smells like Mr. John's or Popeye's chicken, et cetera. It's like, you got to explain, hey, I deliver food and people. Besides... Sometimes I would, wouldn't mind just blasting my music because, or just listening to an audiobook. That's one of the reasons I really love doing Uber Eats. Yeah. I listen to all kinds of audiobooks, uh, financial audiobooks, self developments. And I couldn't do that with someone in the back of my car. So I don't know if y'all have seen that night nice school movie, but there's a Lyft driver in there. And when he's driving around on the phone talking to people, he has a passenger in the back. He's saying, I'm going to give you a one star because he's on the phone. See, stuff like that wouldn't pop up with deliveries, and you can listen to whatever you want. So I said, you know what? I got to admit, this delivery, I like people more, but the delivery is actually improving myself because I can listen to so many audiobooks. 
So I decided to stick with delivery. And I was inspired by someone called The Simple Driver who made great videos on Rideshare. Yeah, I've seen him. And I yeah. typed in for a reason. There was, at the time, there was literally no channel focusing just on Uber Eats. There are people talking about all the apps like Uber Eats, DoorDash, Grubhub. I didn't find any information just on Uber Eats. And based on my experience, I noticed that they're kind of missing a few things, like the algorithm and certain things Uber does. So I say, you know what? Since there's no, there's a void in the marketplace, I'll just be that person to go ahead and start it. Because so many people, I would talk to people like other drivers when I'm waiting at restaurants and tell them about these tips I was finding out. And they literally were genuinely surprised. Like, oh, I didn't know if you did X, Y, Z, then you can get more pings or if you do this, I can increase my amount of tips. Like, more drivers need to know about this. So I felt kind of obliged to start the YouTube channel. And that's where the uh, Uber Eats courses really came through. So that's kind of the origin of the, uh, the app lifestyle. You know, before it was called the Uber lifestyle, but I changed it to the uh, app lifestyle. Yeah, I noticed that uh, there were a lot of people that all of a sudden, that, you know, some of the companies were starting to crack down on using your name, using their name, and some different things like that. So I don't know if that prompted you to make the change. I saw a few other people had to, kind of all around the same time. So I didn't. You're very right. You're very right. You know, and and to me, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense because what you were doing was really, and Art continue to do, really does promote the company. And when they kind of force you to take their name out of it, even though you're still talking about them, I think it, it dilutes some of that uh, promotion that you're able to do for them. But that's just my opinion anyway. Um, I still that opinion, but uh, I guess they don't understand how SEO works. Well, no, that's that's very true. That's very true. And uh, just, just word of mouth and uh, when, when you get – an organic type of promotion like your channel and different things like that. I would think that these companies would understand that that's just gold for them. But, uh, you know, sometimes there's a lot of things they don't seem to understand. We probably don't have a whole lot of time to get into all those things. But, you know, one thing that I uh, wanted to bring up or talk about with that is that in your book, you know, one of the things you really try to get into is talking about developing kind of a well-rounded portfolio of income types. And uh, you kind of have your income personalities and your different styles of income and trying to spread out so that you're not too heavily depending on just one thing. And that, uh, is that kind of, did, did that play a part, I think, in like getting into YouTube and some different things like that? Cause it sounds like, you know, you mentioned you're doing, you know, you did ride share, you were doing some other work for some other things and, uh, and then Uber Eats and then YouTube and maybe talk about that a little bit. Yeah, that definitely uh, played a role in it. I mean, uh, pretty uh, early on, I realized that when it comes to income, you got to have the right expectations. And I've seen so many people throughout the years, they're looking for another way to make money. So they look at all these ways and they just, uh, they either randomly pick one or they just decide to go with one. And then they turn out that they actually either don't like it or they can do it, but it's just not paying enough. And when all that comes to close, they spend so much time on that income and now they don't even want it, maybe six months, a year sometimes even years, then they're kind of walking away all mad. Like I put all this energy into this income and for whatever reason, I don't even want it anymore. And that really inspired me to uh, share my perspective on income because more important than the income itself is really the type because the type is just a conduit for managing your expectations. People will say a lot about uh, passive income, for instance. And it's partly because our society is so focused on get out there and make money, that uh, we overemphasize passive income. But if we stop to think for a sec, let's say if there's no getting out there and getting money, you're just receiving passive income. But what if my friends are going on a vacation, going on a yacht, and they invite me along? I don't have enough money. I would have enough in three months based on just passive income coming in, but I don't have it now. Well, if I have a little what I call my active income, I, I call it permission to be impatient. And that's a great example where Uber Eats and Uber comes into play. I can go out there and make that money, get on the yacht with my friends. And that's an example of really 
categorizing incomes. I go very heavily into that in the book. That way you can really decide what is it you actually want instead of jumping into something because the pressure at the top, oh, I just need money, I just need money. When, okay, what type of income do I want? How do I want to make it? You're setting your expectations so you don't select the wrong type. It just doesn't fit what you want or your personality type. Yeah. I like something in your book where you quoted uh, Robert Kiyosaki and you said that, uh, um, you know, when you're talking about like, let's say doing something like the cruise with your friends or just all sorts of different scenarios, but you had a quote from Robert Kiyosaki where you quoted him as saying that it is the why that gives you the power to do the how. And uh, I've always appreciated that kind of approach. And so talk to me a little bit about that, because you talk a little bit about identifying some of your triggers, identifying the kinds of things that really make a difference to you. And, um, and, and how, how can like we as drivers, whether we're doing our delivery work or other gig work, or even our, our jobs or passive or active, any kind of income, how can we use that why to motivate us? Well, I'm glad you asked. So, um, the why is so important. Our society tends to focus very much on the how. And don't get me wrong, that's important. But uh, if you look up statistics of people who start their own businesses or even get involved in network marketing, like there's a huge percentage of people that they don't follow through. And whenever they get involved, often the system is awesome. Like the how on how to make the money is just laid out in plain print. It couldn't be any more clear but they still fall off. So we've got to ask ourselves, why is that? But why is that is literally the word I keep saying. It's the why. That's the reason that we all need extra money, let's say when we're doing Uber Eats or a ride share, whatever it may be. But what gets you in that car? It's going to be make it a lot easier if you have a strong why. And the why really has two sides. It has a side where you're passionate about something, whatever that may be. You might be uh, passionate about starting your own business, passionate about being able to travel the world, and this is your kind of way to be able to afford it. And on the other side, you also got to have something you really don't like about your current circumstance. Like You don't like the fact that you're going walking through the mall and you're forced to window shop instead of saying, uh, you know what, I want that. Or you might want to get involved in uh, some types of investments, but I don't have any money or I have limited money. Like there's a bigger behind that is people shy away from it because they say, oh, it's going to make me feel bad. But that's a source of power if it has somewhere to be directed. And that's where that why comes in, because if you have the why, then you find out the how. It could be Uber Eats, whatever you did. You can go and put in the work. And anytime you're tired or you know, just mentally strained or feel like giving up, you just play that mental picture of the why in your head. All of a sudden, you're back to what you're doing, full energy. That's why so many people become wealthy. They have very strong whys, whether it be more time to spend with their family, improving the lifestyle of their family as a whole, or it doesn't have to be some uh, humanity or family thing involved. It could just be purely selfish. You might just want to be sitting on your butt on the beach, sipping my ties. If that's a strong <laughs> enough why, as long as you're not hurting anyone, there's nothing wrong with it. Right. Well, and I think that that, and that kind of makes a difference too. And, you know, I think the other side of it is that sometimes we can get so caught up in the, in the how that we forget our why. And, uh, you know, and I think almost as much of a tragedy of not getting anything done, not making any money is to go out there and make the money, but then lose sight of your why and never really accomplish that. So it kind of, you know, you kind of need to use that to create a little bit of balance, I think. You, uh, said some, you, you said something later on in, in the book that you said that more money will not solve your financial problems. And in some cases, it may put them on full display and make them worse. And uh, there were a couple of times like you quoted Dave Ramsey, and I always liked uh, a lot of the stuff that Dave Ramsey had to say. Like one thing that he would say was similar to that, that sometimes it's that money just kind of has a way of amplifying who you are or exposing you, not so much make, you know, fixing things that more money is not going to make you a different person. It's just going to make you more of what you already are. Um, talk a little bit about, uh, I think just building a, 
a foundation because you know you do a lot of this in your book and uh, uh, I think that's going to be coming out here. Is that, uh, I know you've got that schedule to be able to start going live with that here within the next week or so. Is that correct? Yes, actually exactly one week from today. So next Wednesday. Okay. And we'll get a link up for that too, for anybody that wants to uh, get on that book. I really recommend people think about this, but one of the things that you do is you do build a foundation that it's uh, um that it's, you, you don't just start with the how and the why, or well, you don't just start with the how, but you really kind of build a foundation. And, uh, and, and I think that that ties in very well with this idea that sometimes money makes you more of what you are. So t- tell us a little bit about your thoughts about, you know, kind of building that foundation before you get the money. Oh, yeah, most definitely. I mean, the key word is system, system, system. And uh, that's not just a buzzword. I mean, if you think of your why and even your how to some degree as the fuel that's really fueling your uh, financial ambitions, but if you don't have a system to make sure everything stays intact, it's either not going to go anywhere or it's going to come collapsing. So in my book, I talk about how to build the right system for um, your money. Because when it comes to finances, you want to make sure all your bases are covered. A lot of times, just based on our personality, we'll focus on uh, just a few aspects of finances that we find intriguing. Like, for example, some people love to spend money on themselves, and they uh, like to keep up with their bills, and those are important. But they may neglect things like uh, investing your money so you can get some of it in return, or they may neglect their savings. And you could take to the opposite extreme, someone... They are avid savers. They don't like the fact of just going through life without having savings. Like you got to have funds for a rainy day. And they may actually look into investing to some degree, but they hardly ever spend money on themselves. And when it comes between paying bills and like investing in something, that they'll pick the investing. And well, you kind of set yourself up for a quagmire because, yeah, you start getting money from your investments, but and when your car gets repossessed, who are you going to blame? Okay. Right. And if you don't spend money on yourself, you're going to start feeling like a slave, quite literally. You're putting in all this work and not spending any money on yourself. And you wonder why you're depressed. So just having a system of being very well-rounded, making sure all the areas of finance are covered is very important. That's something I'm going to break detail in the book. But just here, even those four points I just mentioned, investing, savings, expenses or bills and spending money on yourself. Just having those as an integral part of your system is just a groundbreaking experience. And if, as long as you make sure you don't drop any of those areas under 5%, what I mean by 5% is you take your annual income, I mean your monthly income, just multiply that times 0.5, then you'll see what 5% is. Make sure none of them drop below that because if you drop below that, that's when that area is neglecting and you're gonna start seeing the negative repercussions not giving it the right attention. Yeah. Yeah. And it really, you want to think, uh, I think I always want to kind of keep in mind the things that you do need to pay attention to. Like you said, you know, uh, you, you getting your car repossessed, you know, if, if you're using your car for delivery, that kind of kills your uh, ability to uh, make money, you know, uh, unless you're a walker. <laughs> there are some markets where people uh, are you know, New York City, probably downtown Chicago, some places like that, that people can walk, but most of us need our cars. So, and, you know, that's that's something that uh, I talk about this sometimes. I call it, you know, I say that our car is like a credit card on wheels because it's like um, our biggest expense is, is our car, you know, unless you are one of those people can walk or ride your bike. But, you know, it's like we don't think of it as much of an expense because all we think about is the gas because that's what's coming out of our pocket right away. But, um you know, talk to us a little bit about, I guess, trying to, you know, from, from a business standpoint, running your business and, and making sure that you're taking care of your money so that you can operate your business. Um, and maybe give us some thoughts, some thoughts on that. Well, uh, first off, I do want to say I am uh, not a tax advisor. So take everything <laughs> I said with a grain of salt. <laughs> That's my legal disclaimer. Absolutely. But the key thing is to really treat this as a business because that's ultimately what it is. And that means that any money you spend on your business, you need to be keeping an accurate record of it. Absolutely. And uh, checking with 
and there's a lot of free resources you can check this out with, like the Turbo Tax. Um, I, there's another one that escapes my mind, but uh, I think it's a mile like QAP. As well as uh, a lot of uh, tax advisors actually do offer a free consultation. But you can just find out exactly what expenses are tax deductible because I've seen people, they don't pay attention to any of this, and they get hit with a huge tax bill at the end yes. of the year. When as a delivery or ride share driver, and by ride share, I do mean Uber X, not the higher platforms, but specifically delivery, if you're keeping track of your expenses and writing off what you can, you shouldn't be paying that much in taxes. In fact, not to brag, but uh, all my years I've been doing Uber Eats, I've always managed to come out over zero. And that all goes down to that record keeping. But I'm not just record keeping. You just want to have a uh, just a mental meter of how your car is doing. Make sure you're getting your, your tires rotated, your um, oil changed, because we use it uh, so much. We do need to keep in mind that things like that, which would need to be done on a regular basis anyway, probably need to be done just a little bit more frequent. And a good habit I have, I know we love blasting our music, more power to you, but maybe just once a week, like on the way home after a shift of doing deliveries, just turn the radio off and just listen to your car. And if you hear anything kind of like weird, then you know to get it checked out before it becomes some kind of major problem. Yeah, yeah, because I mean, that's that's our bread and butter almost kind of literally. And so one thing that I do is like, I figure on about 15 cents a mile is what my overall maintenance cost is going to be once everything goes into, you know, some of it is way down the line, like, you know, your tires and different things like that. And so I try and get into a habit of saving 15 cents a mile. And then when I've got all those things come up, because like right now, I'm, you know, as, as we're talking right now, I'm charging up my uh, battery because it's time for a new alternator. But uh, because of doing that, then at least, you know, when, when you think about some of those things like that and, and you think ahead with your money, then those kinds of things don't knock you for a loop when all of a sudden it's like, oh, my tires just went bald. I've been driving, you know, 30,000 miles a year. And who knew that your tires are going to go bald and have to be replaced every 40,000 miles. <laughs> and so, yeah, you, you want to think about that type of thing. Um, you talk a lot about orthodox. Um, well, you, you actually have like four different quadrants of income. You've got, uh, you've got orthodox versus let me see. I'm trying to remember the other one. It was uh, orthodox between kind of an unstandard. Um, what was your term for that? Oh, uh, there's uh, orthodox income. Then there's unorthodox income. Unorthodox. And orthodox that makes sense. Another word. Yeah. And then you had your passive and your active. And um, maybe talk to us a little bit because there's there's a lot of us that are doing this delivery where it's delivery is the only thing we're doing. Or maybe it's a side hustle, and then uh, we're doing this as part of another job. But there, there are a lot of other ways to do income. And talk a little bit about some of the different types of income that you can make and, um, and about how you can maybe use some of what we're doing in delivery as maybe a launch pad into being able to do more with our money. Well, yeah, definitely. You know, the first thing I would say is you wanted to... You always want to have at least two types of income, different types. And just like you said, there are four quadrants. And based on uh, which one you value more in your life, decides on which ones you want to go after. You know, you're looking for the ultimate control of your income. You might want to look into getting involved in something that allows you to control how much you make. So it's not a standard, okay, this much money is coming in every single month or even every single week. I'm going to make my budget around that. If you really want to get paid based on how much effort you put in, you want to look into something like uh, sales, uh, certain uh, certain apps, things that allow you to more or less the sky is the limit. Even uh, network marketing, if you have that uh, type of personality. And going on the more introverted side, there's plenty of uh, tasks you can do on the uh, computer that are freelancing, like uh, video editing. Uh, believe it or not, on YouTube, those captions that you see where the subtitles appear when you press uh, closed captions, 
Mm-hmm. A lot of people pay a, a website called rev.com, R-E-V.com, to put those in their videos to transcribe it. And they get paid around like 15 or $20 an hour. And it is a freelance work. So it all starts with exactly what you want. Because once you just know what you want, then you know where to look. Going on the other side of the spectrum, let's say you're happy with uh, the amount of work you're putting in, but you do want something on the more passive side. Well, now that you know, okay, what I want is passive. I don't want to work too hard for it. Or I want it to be set up on autopilot. Exactly what do I want to go after? A good example would be uh, starting a YouTube channel, ironically. I mean, there is an ad revenue off of that. Mm -hmm. You can get involved in uh, real estate, certain uh, stocks, certain bonds. Now, I realize I'm not saying you jump into any of this stuff. You would need to invest in your education first. But if those are your ultimate goals, then you know, okay, well, this is the starting place. So let me go ahead and start putting work in building there. But you got to decide which one is more important to you. Do I want to control more of my income and just have the sky be the limit? Or do I want to tackle the more passive side? Now, one thing I think every delivery driver should be doing, and this could be the sky's the limit or it be passive, but we drive around all the time in our vehicles because we're delivering food. I'm sure we've seen more than our fair share of houses that are for sale by owners. If you find a real estate agent or just a real estate investor, and you can find them online or in person, they have referral programs where they'll pay you $500 just to send them a picture of that sign in the home because they have a lead for their business. And if the deal goes through, you just get 500 bucks for spending maybe five minutes of your time. That could just be something real passive that you do in the background every time you see it. Or you could make that a full-time thing. You could, okay, you know what? This delivery thing is my side hustle now. My main objective when I get in my car is to take pictures of those signs so I can get paid. Oh, yeah. No, that's a good idea. I hadn't even thought about that one. Let me ask you for you. Uh, because you've kind of branched into a lot of that. Did you feel like uh, your delivery work kind of helped spur you into more of that? Or was it more like you got into, I think you started with Uber and then moved into Uber Eats. Did that kind of come out of, you've already kind of had that mindset a little bit, and this was just an end result of that? Uh, yeah, this was, a, it was the end result. It's, uh, I guess I'm the conspirator, if you want to put it in those terms. Okay. <laughs> but I definitely use the Uber Eats, somewhat Uber, but more so Uber Eats as a launching pad for a lot of things I got going. Because even managing the YouTube channel, I would be doing deliveries and be listening to the YouTube channel. I mean, YouTube videos while I'm doing it on how to manage the YouTube channel and the results you need to make and how to make money and oh, stuff yeah. like this. And uh, sometimes I'd be listening to uh, audio books on uh, financial uh, education. And like I said, I couldn't do that with people in the car. Well, I could, right. but I'd be getting a one star and you wouldn't have saw too much of me anymore because I would be deactivated. <laughs> so Uber Eats really served as a launching pad in a, a lot of ways, not just directly, but also indirectly. I mean, there was a time where I actually did just go full time in the Uber Eats, and I was able to do that and maintain control of my schedule so where I can look up things and I schedule certain things. I wouldn't be able to do that if I, was, if I wasn't doing Uber Eats because you just turn the app on when you're ready to make money, then you turn it off when you're done. And that's one of the beauties of uh, this gig economy that's been created. Yeah, oh, I agree. Do you think that, uh, what do you think there is, I mean, I guess I'm wanting to kind of go two ways with the question here. So maybe I'll just ask both. Um, do you think, what kind of ceiling do you see on what we can earn with Uber Eats or any of the delivery platforms? Um, because I think there is when you're trading time for money, there is a bit of a ceiling. You know, what kind of ceiling do you see with that? And do you see any likelihood of this becoming less attractive over time? Uh, everything has a ceiling, and it is going to vary on your market, so I can only speak for my market. Mm-hmm. But I would say um, I'm not going to be that person that puts like 60 or 70 hours in. I say the max I would go you know, like 40 or 50. But for me, that's around seven or $800 per week. 
But um, as far as where I see the industry going, this is why it's part of the reason that it really inspired me to write the book. Because I do know that even though uh, these companies are great, they do control the terms and they can make changes that are unfavorable to drivers at any time. So one thing that uh, we all got to really brush up on is learning how to find other opportunities that are out there or create other opportunities. So that I, I've heard someone else say this, I don't want to steal their phrase, but he always says, have backups to your backups. I would oh, yeah. say that, but um, I would extend it just saying that you want to make sure all your bases are covered and not have your sole source of income coming from uh, something that you don't directly control. We control when we get online and offline, but we don't control the rates. So we want to realize that and really set things up outside of the industry or set things up that are complementary to what you're doing. A good example is there's a company called Rapify, and I've uh, covered them on the app Lifestyle, but you can wrap your car and they'll pay you for miles driven within a certain area. And that's actually passive income because you're already driving out there for deliveries. Right. So you see how you're still doing what you're doing, but you're increasing your income. Mm -hmm. Looking at little things like that, you can really make all the difference, but it starts with you realizing, okay, well, I want to have an exit plan for this, or I want to have a plan to where this becomes more of a side thing. And then my main thing is really starting to take off. And that could, uh, it doesn't have to strictly be entrepreneurship. It could be you getting a trade and uh, becoming educated, and then you have more value to bring to the marketplace. So you can become a freelancer in that trade or get a, a high paying job. And then you might hop in and do deliveries because you want some extra money. And say you're engaged and you want to save up money to get the engagement ring. Hop in Uber Eats and get that money and hop out. You can do it like that. Yeah. But you got to have a game plan for all that. If you don't, you're just going to keep driving and driving and then let's say the companies make a change in our favor, like, oh man, this is, uh, I don't like it. It won't be as big of a deal if you do have other things set up or if you're setting up things at the very least. Yeah. And folks, uh, you know, if, uh, one thing I would tell you to do is if you didn't notice it, back up a few minutes, um, go back and re-listen or something. If you didn't catch Elijah talking about this, about what he's doing when he's driving around. He's talking about, you know, listening to the audio books and, you know, learning and listening to YouTube channels. And, and I think that's, that's, that's a big thing. I always like to say that this is kind of like that this can really be a gateway drug for, you know, uh, for a lot of us, we're kind of accidental entrepreneurs, you know, and uh, maybe didn't plan to run a business, but there are a lot of elements of it that are part of that. And, but I'm hoping that it can kind of become for a lot of us, maybe something that inspires us to want to go well beyond something that involves trading time for money and, and things like this. And, and so I really like what you said about just taking your time. We've got all sorts of time in the car. So, you know, take that time and learn and, you know, find where you want to go next and start preparing for that because gosh, you're getting paid to learn, you know, and that's, that's kind of one of those, not as easily measurable things. Like you said, you know, you, you get paid, you know, if you do the Rapify, you get paid some money for having that, you know, advertising on your car while you're driving around. But there's another way that you're getting paid. And that's just that, that time that you get. And when you can use that to learn, it's kind of like you're paying yourself. Um, any other bits of advice that you would like to leave us with uh, as, as we wrap up here today? Uh, I wrap up by re-emphasizing what you re-emphasizing what you just said, and really taking advantage of that time that you have in the car, and uh, educating yourself on it can be a, a new trade you want to learn or a particular skill set. You know, I actually have a video on my YouTube channel, and it was a pun, but the video's titled "Let Uber Eats Pay for Your Education." Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. And obviously, it's not like it's in a tuition sense, but it is technically happening if you do it that way. And what you said about this being kind of a gateway to uh, more entrepreneur things, I definitely agree. Because uh, before I, um, the first thing I did in terms of uh, making money actually was a solo business venture I uh, did. It was called Indigenous Remedies where I uh, sold herbal capsules, herbal teas. 
And I have figured a lot of things about business from that venture. And uh, when I started doing these apps, I just, the first thing I thought about was, you know what? This is actually a great entry point for anyone who wants to do anything business like or entrepreneur like, because it doesn't have all the elements of it, but one thing it does have, well, if you want to make more money and keep some of the money, well, you got to be analytical. You got to look at how much you're making and find little ways you can make additional money and finding out ways to make sure you keep that money and not get wrapped into the IRS so much. <laughs> and those are skill sets that, you know, they're very heavily involved in business and you're, you're kind of learning them right here. So if you spend at least six months to a year just doing this type of business, you're actually pretty well equipped already to go and to either start something on your own or get involved in something. So it's a great learning experience just in itself. It is. That's outside of, you know, what we just talked about. Yeah. Yeah, because all of a sudden you come out of this and it's not like a job where it's kind of like, okay, I just went out and I did some work or whatever. Because now you've come out of it and you've had to deal with business taxes. You've had to deal with all sorts of things like, you know, you know, setting your schedule, which is really... You know, it's market research. And, and there's so much that what we do it just gives you some skills that you can build on those and uh, you can do so much more from that. Well, Elijah, I wanna thank you again for coming on, being with us today. And folks, I, I definitely encourage you, uh, as, soon as, uh, as soon as we've got, as soon as that comes out, I'll put links up so that you can check out his book. It's called The Anatomy of Financial Success. Uh, Cause that's a huge part of what we do is just understand the money. I think the better you understand the money, the better you get with everything else that you're doing. So folks, thanks again for uh, stopping in and Elijah, thank you very much. I'm glad you have me. Uh, just I always say, uh, be safe out there and stay profitable. Absolutely. Absolutely. So what did you think Courier Nation? I really appreciate Elijah coming on and joining us here for today's episode. Uh, he's just got some great information, and I really encourage you to check out his book when it comes out uh, about another week away. And in the meantime, go check out his YouTube channel. He has got a channel that is called The App Lifestyle. I'll put a link in the show notes, but he's just got some great information. He has He's got a whole series of tutorials about how to do um, what is... Uh, generally centered around Uber Eats, but most of his information you can pretty much apply across the board with all the different delivery companies. He's got some great information. And once his book comes out, I'll get you a link for that in the show notes so that you can go to that as well. Um, his book is called The Anatomy of Financial Success, The Key to Building Financial Confidence and Destroying Financial Insecurity. And you know, that's, that's the thing that really got us into this whole delivery gig, isn't it? It's it's about the money. It's about making that money and what you're going to do with it. But information like what Elijah is providing, it's the kind of stuff that takes you to the next level, you know? It's all about taking control of your money. Now, Courier Nation, I want to ask you one thing as we wrap up. Are we providing good information for you? Is, is the podcast and the website and our business tips, are they useful for you? Because if they are, please let people know about us. Leave a review where you get your podcast, share us on social media. All of that stuff helps us get found. And if we can get found, we can help more people like you take control of your delivery business. And that's what this is all about. Never forget, folks, to do exactly that as we go today. Take control, go out there, and be the boss. Be the boss.